Hi there and welcome here to this first explaining history video on the long-term causes of the Russian Revolution. Okay, so what we're going to do is we, we're taking the long view in, in this video uh, about what caused the, the Russian Revolution and in, in a couple of videos time we're going to look at some more short-term causes. If you're not familiar with Russia, if you have never been to Russia, if you have uh, never studied anything to do with Russia, it's important to understand some, some basic kind of historical and geographical facts about Russia, particularly in the 19th century. And if we understand these, then it makes the reason why there is a revolution uh, make a, an awful lot more sense. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the period today from 1861 to 1917 in a kind of an outline, admittedly, and we're going to look at why there were these huge and seemingly unstoppable problems within Russia. OK, so um, we're going to look at the relationship between the czars of Russia and the people uh, and why it is the czars um, could see the danger of revolution. They weren't blind to it. Um, but each and every time, um, over the course of about four generations, failed to do anything about it that was meaningful or could really arrest the problem. OK, before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. This is the first part of a series of presentations. We're going to cover a lot of material. Making notes is always a good idea. I'm going to talk at length, and not everything I say will be covered on the PowerPoint, so write things down. If you need to clarify anything, drop me a line at the blog here, explaininghistory.org. Um, you can message me there or email me. Um, and the presentation is going to cover some complex stuff. Now, my job is to make them as accessible as possible, uh, but you might have to revisit this a couple of times. Um, in order to really, really immerse yourself in the knowledge. And that's fine, that's no problem. Um, there's no no issue with that. Just keep coming back uh, as many times as you need to. So, in this section, what are we covering? Well, our goal is to understand the long-term social, economic and political forces that led to the collapse of the Russian Empire by 1917. We will examine political factors, uh, such as the Russian autocracy, the demand amongst the people for change, and progressive and revolutionary forces. And I'll, I'll talk about what those mean in just a moment. We'll look at social factors, the development of new social classes. That will be for our, our next PowerPoint. Uh, and the anger of the peasants. And then we're going to look at the impact of economic change on, on the regime. So let's just look back at political factors. Russia had a system of government that we call an autocracy. It meant that the, the Russian um, system of ruling the empire hadn't changed for several centuries. Uh, and it was um, the kind of... Uh, the kind of system of government that you'd have seen in some 17th or 18th century Europe before the French Revolution. And the, the Tsars of Russia were in charge. They were capable of ignoring anything um, that didn't suit them. They were um, resistant to democratic change. They believed that they had been placed on the throne in order to rule by God. Um, and they were able to. Uh, ignore the advice of government ministers and they were able to kind of sideline expertise uh, in general. There were some slightly cleverer czars um, who recognised that this was not a sustainable way to go about running a huge empire. And then there were weaker czars, uh, the, the, the weakest of all being Nicholas II, who is deposed in uh, 1917. Okay. So here's something to bear in mind. Governing Russia. During the 19th century, Russia would have been a difficult country to rule, even with a functioning state. There are some countries that are uh, presented with huge, huge challenges um, and they need to have highly competent governments in order to survive them. 
if you think about um, the governments that survived the Second World War, for example, presented with what we call existential challenges, the, uh, uh, the possibility of being uh, wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, and yet only through very, very strenuous and efficient administration did they survive, you know, Britain particularly. Russia by the mid 19th century uh, is not run in that way. Russia by the mid 19th century was a vast land that stretched from Finland to China. It's, it's a, it stretched from kind of the Arctic to the Black Sea. It's still the, the Russian Federation, the largest uh, continuous uh, landmass nation state stroke empire in the world. Much of Russia was impassable. Um, there weren't railways that, um, that or there, weren't, there wasn't a significant amount of, of, of railway that united the country. Much of the way one got around Russia was via, uh, via horse and cart along muddy tracks, which became impassable in the winter. All sorts of stories of uh, Russian uh, travellers being sucked into muddy bogs um, and being, or their horses being lost in shipping great potholes. Um, it's often not safe to travel around Russia. There are um, uh, bandits or um, uh, other kind of uh, sources of, of, of violence on, on the roads. Um, there are parts of Russia that the people in towns and cities, or particularly the government, virtually never visit. They have little knowledge of. And Russia, of course, um, the well, Russian Empire um, stretches all the way into Asia. There are countless non-Russian nationalities, Poles, Ukrainians, um, Koreans, uh, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Georgians, um, there are small settlements of Germans, there are large numbers of Jewish people, um, the, uh, the numbers of languages, religions practiced um, is uh, kind of quite, uh, quite complex and it would have taken an efficient government to manage to, to rule this successfully, but an efficient government isn't what you have. You have a, a, a government that becomes increasingly sclerotic um, and becomes increasingly chaotic and attached to old ideas, attached to the ideas of the autocracy, which we are going to uh, look at uh, pretty soon. Um, why do you have this? Well, in the late 17th, early 18th century, the, the great reformer, Tsar, or Tsar is the term for emperor, Peter the Great, who built St. Petersburg, attempted to really haul Russia into the, the modern era and, intend, and attempted to impose a Western style system of rulership on Russia that was the product of the Enlightenment. This was known as the Petrine tradition in Russian history. Um, and it was about trying to emulate the West. If you look at a city like um, St. Petersburg, it looks very much like kind of Vienna or Berlin or even parts of London or Paris or um, you know, Naples. It's a very, very European looking city. And it, it is there on the Gulf of Finland, quite literally looking westwards. And Peter the Great says that is how Russia should change and how Russia should grow. It should emulate the great nations of, of Europe because they have higher living standards, they have uh, better armies, they have, um, they understand, they, they have better educated populations, and they're more scientific, and they will be more powerful. There's another tradition within Russian um, politics and history called the Muscovite tradition. And this was favoured by some of the later Tsars, particularly by Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia. And the Muscovite tradition, or a kind of what we call the Slavophile tradition, um, Slavophile meaning a lover of all things Slavic, and the Slavs are obviously the ethnic group 
that the, the Russian people come from. This tradition said Russia's future lies not in embracing European ways. Russia's future lies in understanding the, the, the mystical and religious Russian past. Um, that the, the, the good kinds of Russians are the peasants because they worship the Tsar, they believe in the Tsar, and they are good Orthodox Russian Christians, uh, and they um, are uh, the, the kind of the, the heart and the soul of Russia. And that Russia has a special and different historical trajectory. It's not meant to develop like a Western country is meant to develop. It is meant to have an autocracy, and it is meant to be ruled by the Tsar along uh, spiritual lines set down by the Russian Orthodox Church. Really, really very, very different. And as far as industrialization goes, the Muscovite tradition questioned whether that was necessary at all. Perhaps um, all you needed to do is ensure the peasants have a good life um, and that they were loyal and obedient. But it was difficult for the peasants to have a good life, and we'll see why. So Russia kept expanding eastwards throughout the 19th century. The Russian Empire steadily expanded eastwards throughout the 19th century, incorporating many non-Russian peoples, Georgians, Uzbeks, Tatars, Kazakhs, Chinese, Turks and Koreans. Ethnic Russians were normally Orthodox Christians, but the empire incorporated Catholics, Jews, Muslims and many other faiths. Despite the vast territory, much of the land was not suitable for farming, with the richest soils being in the west, in Ukraine. Over 90% of the population were peasants, uh, and there was mass illiteracy, low life expectancy, and poor productivity. So you've got some crippling fundamental weaknesses in this vast land empire. Not much of the land was particularly suited for farming. There are parts of, uh, parts of the west, parts of, of the empire, Ukraine and, and uh, that region and parts of Russia in, in the West that were referred to as Russia's Black Earth provinces. Black Earth means, you know, rich peaty soil that you can grow pretty much anything from wheat, vegetables, and ideal for raising cattle. And these are, this the, the Ukraine is the breadbasket of, of Russia uh, in the uh, years after the revolution is sought after by firstly Poland and then during the Second World War uh, the Nazis as a, a, a source of um, food security you know, for a way of ensuring that the their countries could be uh, fed um, in, uh, for, in the long term. But a lot of the land isn't, it, just like it, the fact that, as, as I previously mentioned, it's impassable, you can't get around, a lot of it isn't really ideal for farming. And so you, you result in a, 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 a country that's hard to navigate, and so it's quite chaotic, and it's also quite poor. And the attempts to industrialise Russia, as we'll see, never really uh, quite succeed. Russia fails to become, in the 19th century, a capitalist nation in the way that, say, Britain or the USA does. Uh, and by the time you get to the revolution of, of 1917, immense pressures from the First World War have been placed on Russia that uh, have been placed not on a, a, a well a resourced financial society, but in a struggling and poor uh, agricultural one. The, the fact that you get a large number of peasants with uh, little or illiterate, most of them, um, that have low life expectancy and that have poor productivity, i.e. They, they don't farm particularly well, they farm uh, uh, in a, a very weak and a very uh, inefficient way, which we'll look at in the next video. This means that despite its size and despite its population, Russia fails to break out of, of the, the, the poverty trap or the de development trap um, and fails to become like a, a modern European nation.
to Russia's place in the world. The Russian aristocracy and nobility were often educated in France, Britain or Germany and were part of the cosmopolitan elites of, the 19th, of 19th century Europe. So they would, they would often speak slightly better French or English than they did Russian. Uh, and certainly their world would have been uh, educated in education in, in Paris, um, where they would attend uh, society balls and be uh, very well educated for, and then to get a university education in Great Britain, where they would go to Oxford or Cambridge, and um, and then we re return to Russia. Um, they are trying to rule this country that doesn't see itself as fully European or Asian. It sees itself as something in the middle, something distinct, something different. And it's very difficult for them to relate to this um, quite alien culture of the, the people that, that they, they rule over. Culturally and linguistically, Russia has always been distinct and separate from Europe. And this really mattered in the 19th century because European nation states were in the process of transforming the world. The, les the lessons of, of European industrial and political revolutions were often ignored by Russian stars who hoped they could hold back change and sweeping from the West. Um, Russian czars often believed that um, revolutionary ideas from the West and, the, and political ideas from the West and even kind of the industrial revolution coming from the West was not desirable. Um, there's a, a famous and possibly apocryphal story of what happened when the works of Karl Marx, the great revolutionary, were translated into Russian. Marx said, you know, once a working class builds up, it will become politically conscious and aware of its exploitation and overthrow the bourgeoisie. And this was seen as it required reading by Russia's middle classes and Russia's upper classes because they said, wait a minute, this, this Marx fellow, whoever he is, is sending us a warning. We can't allow industrialization. That would be far too dangerous. So Russian uh, elites found themselves kind of straddling a, a, a gap between where they were and where the people they ruled were. So, how do you think that would have affected how ordinary Russians saw their rulers? Well, as you can probably imagine, one of the ways in which, um, or one of the problems that, that emerges is that many peasants, which make up the bulk of the population, don't see themselves as having really any relationship or any relation to the landlords who, who rule them. In on Russian estates, often the landlords aren't there. Um, the landlords are, uh, as we shall explore in the next video, hugely disliked by, by the peasants because of the, the legacy of serfdom, which is essentially um, Russia's kind, Russia's form of, of quasi kind of chattel slavery. Um, but the, the Russian peasants didn't see themselves as, an, as having much relationship to the ruling classes. And they are, you know, those that were more educated and particularly workers in the towns and cities wondered whether you can really think of um, the Russian ruling classes as particularly Russian at all. And this matters because throughout the 19th century in Russia, in uh, the United Germany after 1871, in France, in Italy, questions of national identity and nationhood and belonging to the nation, citizenship of the nation, these are, these are quite revolutionary questions. Russia has um, a, a Bolshevik revolution in October 1917, but there were nationalist questions happening um, or being asked by Russian people throughout the 19th century. Um, and having a ruling class that doesn't really, uh, is, is really quite cosmopolitan, is really, uh, spends much of its, if not much, then some of its time abroad, 
um, and has little knowledge of Russia, little, um, and, and it sometimes even doesn't speak much Russian. Um, the the question occurs to many peasants, well, um, or um, the the new rising working class is, well, what what do we keep these people around for? But anyway, these revolutionary questions are pretty irrelevant for a long period of time in Russia because um, the autocracy is so successful in controlling Russia. So here's our question about how was Russia ruled. Russia is an autocracy ruled by an emperor known as the Tsar. OK, so Russia works on a set of rules called the Fundamental Laws of Empire. These were written in 1832. They were gradually watered down throughout the century, particularly um, after 1854. Um, but they are resurrected by um, Nicholas II. The Fundamental Laws of Empire. In 1832, the Tsarist regime introduced the Fundamental Laws, which gave the Tsar virtually unlimited power to decide how ordinary Russians lived. The, the fundamental uh, laws said that the source of all legal authority was the Tsar. Everything is done in the Tsar's name. The Tsar has all power and that he can uh, make and unmake any law. He can be advised by ministers. He does not have to take that advice. He does not have to rely on any elected assembly like a parliament or in Russia's case, the Duma. Um, and that... Russians themselves don't have their own rights. You know, if we, you live in a even a vaguely liberal society, wherever you are around the world, you have your own rights because you were born. And most constitutions say any individual has the following rights. There's certain things you're not allowed to do, but you have the following rights and they belong to you. However, in an autocratic society, your rights, if they do exist at all, they don't belong to you, they belong to the Tsar, the Tsar chooses to give them to you, and he can remove them as well, uh, and is at liberty to, to do so. So, Russia had been ruled by one family, the Romanov dynasty, since 1613. The Tsars of Russia had successfully avoided the fate of other European ruling dynasties, which had either been overthrown completely or reduced to constitutional monarchies. So if you put it into context, in 1649, it's, that's the year that Charles, the, Charles I is uh, beheaded. Um, so uh, by, you know, um, by the, the late 19th century, countries like Great Britain and France and Italy, to some extent Germany, though it's a more complicated case, have become constitutional monarchies. The Tsars of Russia, in the case of France, obviously a republic, beg your pardon. The Tsars of Russia had successfully avoided the fate of other European ruling dynasties, which had become overthrown completely or been reduced to constitutional monarchies. By the start of the 20th century, the Tsar of Russia still had complete power over the empire and was not required to pay any attention to his ministers if he chose not to. So, in a way, Nicholas II of Russia has more in common with the Qing dynasty of China than he does with the Kaiser of Germany in terms of the extent of his powers. The Tsar was a source of all legal authority in Russia and could decide what the laws said. Um, and the Tsars believed that they derived their authority from God, um, not from the people. When Nicholas II came to the throne, he wasn't particularly happy about this at all. It disrupted his otherwise happy life. He said, um, you know, why has this terrible fate befallen me? However, he was incapable of giving up any of the power that he had received. One of the reasons for that is he said, well, this power was given to me by God himself. It's not mine to give up. I can't just go doing that. So, throughout the 19th century, it had become clear to some of Russia's czars that the country needed to change in order to become, uh, to avoid becoming fatally weakened. One, re one kind of shocking example of this fatal weakness 
was the Crimean War. And the Crimean War um, that uh, in which Britain, France and the Ottoman Empire humiliate uh, Russia um, in a, a dispute over Russia's kind of gradual encroachment into the Ottoman Empire and uh, the panic amongst the uh, British and French that uh, Russia would become too powerful uh, in, in the East. Um, even a, an army as badly run as Great Britain's, and it is particularly badly run, because it's mechanised, manages to defeat the Russians. Uh, the French are, uh, are, are operate in a much more effective way, but British soldiers have um, better engineered weapons. Um, they sail iron hold battleships. Um, they use railway in order to move, they build their own railway in order to move goods from uh, the shore to the front line. Um, the British lay a telegraph cable from Crimea to London, uh, which is how the uh, Times newspaper receives its exclusives from its journalist in Crimea, William Howard Russell. Um, so in, in every way, Russia is uh, Russia that had been used to throwing huge numbers of soldiers at the enemy, as they had done in the Napoleonic Wars. Russia is outclassed in, in every conceivable way by Great, uh, by Great Britain and by, uh, by France. So um, after the Crimean War, from 1856 onwards, um, Alexander II, the new Tsar, who'd come to power uh, when Nicholas I had died during the war, um, Alexander II says that you know, there must be a period of modernization in Russia in order for Russia not to essentially uh, uh, collapse or wind up, uh, this is a great fear of Russian nationalists, wind up being a kind of an economic or a colony or an actual colony of um, European powers. No czar was willing to alter the nature of power in Russia to create meaningful constitutional reforms. So the autocracy existed until it was swept away in 1917. So, so Tsar Alexander II, for example, did introduce some reforms, some institutional reforms, that uh, were going to be helpful in helping Russia to develop. But the real stuff, the, the constitutional change, the who exercises power um, and in whose interests do they exercise it and how do they do it, that stuff, doesn't change at all. And what that means is that uh, Russia continues to stagnate. Um, if you look at any country around the world that is really struggling to make any sort of meaningful change at all, uh, it's normally because the operating of power, who is the decision maker and um, who put them there, how you can how can you get rid of them? This is is kind of entirely corrupted or falling apart. So um, no czar was willing to, to really change that. Um, some of Russia's czars, particularly Alexander II, who we'll come to next, sought to reform aspects of Russia's institutions, such as the army, local government and education. They wanted to make that more, more efficient, but the power of the czars remained unchanged. By far the greatest reform of the 19th century, however, was the ab abolition of serfdom. Serfdom, which is the bonding of labour to its its master and to the land, uh, to take peasants and make them kind of unfree. They're not quite at the level of slavery because often in the case of serfs, you don't sort of buy them and sell them on the open market. But the serfs belong to the uh, the peasant and can't, the, 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 the noble and can't leave the land. And the noble can interfere in their lives in a whole range of ways and violently punish them when he sees fit. Serfdom was being abolished uh, in its last vestiges uh, across European places like Hungary and Romania and Prussia throughout the 19th century. And in Russia, Alexander II um, manages to see uh, serfdom abolished in 1861. Um, and the reforms themselves, as we shall see, 
uh, start off as something potentially uh, emancipatory and liberal and promising, but they are, but it is undone. The kind of the great dream of the peasants uh, fails to materialise, and we'll find out now why the uh, emancipation of the peasants failed to materialise and what the consequences of that were. It was because this creates the revolutionary tensions throughout Russia. In 1861, Tsar Alexander II abolished serfdom, attempting to give Russia's peasants some degree of freedom. Many historians believe that this began a revolutionary period that lasted until 1928. The failure of emancipation had far-reaching consequences. So, for example, in the um, aftermath of the uh, Emancipation Edict, the hopes of the serfs are sky high. They believe that um, the Tsar Liberator has come to do the right thing and to um, free them from their bondage. And you can see in the, the picture in the top uh, right of the screen um, how peasants were used as sweated labour. Here you have essentially humans humans being treated like barge horses pulling pulling on, on a tugboat. Um, and the, the, the serfs were forced to give a significant chunk of their time and, and energy in terms of free labour to the people whose land they lived on. The, in the 19th century, the, uh, during the emancipation, the landlords um, managed to intervene with the Tsar. Now, the landlords in Russia were the, the kind of the mainstay of the economy. Russia hadn't had much of an industrial revolution by this point, so there isn't a class of businessmen and bankers and entrepreneurs and um, ship manufacturers and mine owners. There is there are only landlords. The landlords themselves aren't always particularly rich. They're re heavily reliant on um, the, the not having to pay for their workers. Um, and they don't want to kind of give that up. They want to continue with their business as usual. But they definitely don't want to pay for their workforce. They don't have to pay wages. Some of them, some of the um, landlords who lived in the countryside were also were a bit frightened about what the countryside might be like if serfdom wasn't there to protect them, if they didn't have the power to discipline, punish, and um you know perhaps even to kill if they needed to uh, and they feared what a russia a post serfdom russia might look like so they get onto the czar and say well you know we must be compensated if you want to take away our free labor much as the the slave owners uh, 30 years before in, in uh, the british empire demanded and were successful in demanding to be compensated for their lack of slaves so the um, uh, the, the landowners, the, the people who own the serfs, demanded from the Tsar that they be compensated. This left the uh, government with a huge bill. Um, how did the government pay for the, um, the costs of emancipation? Well, they placed the costs of emancipation on the shoulders of the peasants themselves. So the peasants have a debt that they need to pay back over um, the course of 40 years to the government. Um, being as, you know, if you're a peasant and you're um, emancipated midway through your life, you haven't got 40 years to pay us back in. So the debt is inherited by your children. The landlords then do something, you know, pretty, pretty underhand to the peasants. They say, OK, well. You can be emancipated with a bit of land, but we will keep the the good bits, the the black earth um, provinces. Um, you can uh, even if you were um, used to um, farming one of those nice bits of black earth land, you're now booted off that, and you can go and eke out a living on some scrubby bit of wasteland. Um, instead, we'll ha um, have that and. You can you can live in in dire poverty, but you know with with your freedom. 
so it's hard to put into words the kind of the level of resentment and anger that is sparked. Peasant rebellions uh, in the next 30 years um, suddenly become uh, a, a fairly regular affair. They had not happened very often prior to that or have been that widespread. But after the uh, Edict of Emancipation, there are large numbers of peasant revolts and uprisings. What the peasants wanted um, was they wanted land and they were hungry for land uh, and understandably so because land to them is life and land to them is security. So there were some good reasons for wanting to abolish serfdom. From the late 18th century onwards, serfdom was abolished across Eastern and Central Europe. So abolition was not a new idea. It had been uh, something that had been ongoing. Um, Alexander II, who was known as the Tsar Liberator, and you know the extent to which that's true is very, very debatable, given what we've just said about the, the kind of the shortcomings of um, the emancipation. Um, he understood that unless you do something about serfdom, it's a ticking time bomb. Um, and that it, unless you do something about it, it will, um, he said, it could reform itself from below. You know, the serfs could take the matters into their own hands one day, unless you're careful. Um, backwardness. Alexander was aware that serfdom had led, left Russia a backward and inefficient country. If you rely on free labour that has to be kind of coerced, you know, isn't voluntary, they're not choosing to be uh, treated in this way, um, you're, you're going to have a country that's always going to be poor. Uh, you're going to have a country where um, the, the peasants uh, or the serfs are engaged in mainly subsistence farming um, and that that won't create agricultural surpluses. If you don't have agricultural surpluses, i.e. more than you consume, um, or you have very small agricultural surpluses, then it becomes difficult to feed the towns and the cities. And why do you need to do that? Because large numbers of workers will go there, or large numbers of peasants will leave the land, go to the towns and cities, find cheap food there, whilst working in things like, um, you know, cotton mills and steel foundries and that's the way you, you sort of have an industrial revolution. One of the things that ensured that Great Britain had an industrial revolution was surpluses of food, uh, enough for people to eat so that they could engage in non-agricultural work uh, such as, uh, as industrial work. There's one thing I wanted to say about the previous slide. Um, that from 1861, the, the failure to uh, abolish serfdom in a way that actually left the serfs, the, uh, the serfs in any way liberated, uh, some historians believe, creates a period of crisis and unrest that is only, only resolved with the advent of Stalin to power. And so it's a huge, huge factor in undermining the um, uh, undermining um, Tsarist Russia. Um, and when you think about, you're talking about the the affairs of the vast majority of the population. It's hardly any wonder. So here is Alexander the Second. Was Alexander the Second a Tsar liberator? Alexander's plans to deprive the nobles of their free labour met with stiff resistance. Eventually, the nobles were compensated for, um, for their, their loss, I apologise for the terrible spelling error, their loss by the state. And the debts incurred by the government were passed on to the peasants who were freed in decades of debt, as we know. Many landlords offered peasants the worst land, keeping the black earth for themselves. So Alexander was every bit the autocrat his predecessors were. He believed that limited reform could preserve the autocracy. And this is the key point. This was not Alexander II trying to be a nice guy, because czars are not nice guys. This was Alexander II 
trying to find new ways to preserve the aristocracy. And that's the whole point of all of this. He was not interested in surrendering any power whatsoever. He thought if this was this was the clever strategy to making sure that he never had to do that. So was he the Tsar Liberator? No, not really. Um, he was simply a Tsar who was trying to adapt to a changing world. And if you remember what we said right at the very beginning of this PowerPoint, um, a, a lot of the, um, the problems of Russia was the fact that Russia is changing and the Tsars themselves aren't able to keep up with that. Why does emancipation lead to instability? The hopes that many peasants had were crushed by the reality of emancipation. Unrest and anger and outbreaks of rioting amongst the peasants rapidly escalated during the two decades after emancipation. Russian Tsars had little understanding of the realities of peasant life. They romanticised the peasants as loyal subjects, but this was often highly misleading. And because they don't understand that, because they think that the peasants are, are, are almost like good little children, they don't realise that peasant life is actually quite violent, is actually quite volatile, and that Russian peasants, um, whilst they have uh, of, will often have an icon, a picture of the Tsar and of uh, the uh, of of Jesus Christ in their peasant huts, um, they they don't like the state very much. They are suspicious of. Uh, the uh, the Tsar's government, they see the Tsar's government, when they encounter the Tsar's government, it's either a policeman or a tax collector. Um, and they think that um, the, the Tsar is probably surrounded by wicked or incompetent advisors who are looking to exploit the good folk of Russia. And um, more than anything else, what the peasants are interested in is, is in acquiring land, because if you acquire a bit of land, that's your ticket out of the, the miserable poverty you live in. And if you can acquire a bit of land, then you will be able to make your way kind of up, up the ladder slightly. So the, the hopes that were raised so highly with the emancipation come crashing down because they're actually, the, 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 the peasants are actually, some find themselves in a worse situation than they were when they were serfs. So we'll bring this to a close in a moment. So in the next presentation, what we're going to do is you're going to explore, uh, we'll explore together how Russian social classes uh, in the empire changed and how the, uh, and the effect of this on the stability of the empire. Um, also, we'll examine uh, Alexander II's reforms, his other reforms, uh, and see how this led to his assassination in 1881. Okay, so I hope you found this useful. Remember to, to in all these presentations, take plenty of notes. You can email me if you need to, um, and um, I, I think uh, that you'll find when we get on to looking at how we turn all this into an essay, that's going to be really, really helpful. Anyway, thanks very much, and I'll see you on the next video. All the best. Bye-bye.